I, I have the pleasure of giving a talk today that's about a hands-on project. You know, a lot of what we're doing is sort of seeing how the furniture is arranged on the Titanic, I'm afraid, but we're trying to actually throw some lifeboats in the water for this plant. This is a plant many of you know, it's a listed endangered species. All, all the known extant populations are within 10 miles of St. George. It's on the, the brink of being swallowed up by development. So our objective is to try to start some new populations on federal land that's further away from St. George that's in suitable habitat. But just a little bit about the life history. It uh, emerges from uh, the seed bank in spring produces a first year plant that usually doesn't make any seeds. Then along about the middle of May, they just go to sleep. They're spring ephemerals. They stay asleep all the way through summer, fall, winter, and they don't emerge again till the next spring. And then usually if all goes well that spring, they flower and they produce a lot of seeds. And they could go through that cycle again. They are perennials, but Usually the first or second year as adult plants are the, are the big uh, seed production years. So the key life history features is this spring ephemeral perennial phenology, relatively short lifespan, three or four years is usually about the max. They, make a, they know how to make seed very well, but they don't do it every year, it's episodic. The seeds are hard seeded, it's a legume, right? They produce seeds that are physically dormant and they can persist in the seed bank or, 10 years or more, but, but once the seeds become non-dormant and in a, most springs, they do recruit some, they recruit uh, from seed. So those are, those are some of the features that are disadvantages as well as advantages that have enabled them to persist. I first got involved with this species in 20, 2013 when Renee Van Buren, who worked, she had a 22 year data set demographic data set on this species. And she asked me to, to help her write a population viability analysis for this species, which we did. And we completed that in 2015. We're just getting it published right now. But one of the main take homes from this PVA was that if you put seeds there, it will be there, that you should be able to establish new populations if you can find suitable unoccupied habitat, you should be able to establish new populations just by sowing seeds. Well, a lot of rare plants, it's hard to get your hands on very many seeds, so that's not a very feasible solution. But we were in an interesting position back in 2015. I'd never seen the plant when I was writing the PVA. I didn't, I'd never seen it. But in the spring of 2015, Renee arranged for us to go collect seeds from a place called the Central Valley population. And this was on state trust lands that was slated to be sold for development, one of the best populations of the species. So in 2015, we figured that the whole population was toast. So we started to salvage seeds and we salvaged seeds there for several years and ended up with about 250,000 salvaged seeds. And believe it or not, that probably didn't even make a dent in the seed production there, which is good because now they're gonna they're gonna put a preserve in the middle of it, which is excellent news, but that's another story. Anyway, that's how we got the one way we got seeds to do this introduction study. The other way we got seeds was my good friend and partner, Bitsy Schultz spent two years, excuse me, spent two years learning how to grow this thing in containers for seed production. And everything went great. The plants grew great. We got through all of the problems with propagation and everything, except the bees never came. We were doing this in Northern Utah. The plants flowered too early for the correct pollinator. So we got 44,000 seeds over two years and she did it all hand pollinating the, seed, the flowers. So we had 44,000 more seeds on top of the 250,000 that we could use for these introduction studies. So then we, we spent a couple of years and my main partners in, in crime on this were, were Bitsy and my colleague from Utah Valley University, Cody Rominger, who passionately loves this plant and many plants. And he and I and Bitsy basically did all this field work single-handed for a couple of years and learned how to grow, how to get these, these plants to establish from seed in the field. 
we were blessed with a good year in 2017 and had good success so we could figure out what our treatments meant. So by the fall of 2018, we figured we had seeds, we had the knowledge of how to plant them so they would come up, and we also had knowledge of where we should plant them. Because another thing we'd been working on a lot over those years was trying to improve the habitat suitability model for this species so that we could go and find new places that would actually be likely to support the population, new populations. So this is the big population state line that uh, is, is the best protected. It's a, it's a large BLM population on BLM land. The Central Valley population where we salvaged seed was over here. And we didn't even bother to draw it on the map in that, at that time because we thought it was toast. And this is before St. George really, excuse me, before St. George really took off. But anyway, we used our, our improved habitat suitability model. We went across the river and found these little places to try introductions. And we also tried some augmentation seedings at South Hills and Purgatory, which were fringe populations that looked to be on the way out because of inbreeding depression. So we augmented them with genetic material from Central Valley in the hope that that would kick, kickstart them a little bit. We, we were originally gonna do just one or two big, big plantings and put fences around them and all of that, but it didn't work out that way. So we ended up with eight different sites over here that were all slightly different from each other. And we figured we could use that to evaluate what really would be the best kind of site to put, the, to put our seedings. So what we did at each of these 10 sites, the eight introductions and the two augmentations, we set up three 30 foot plots, marked them with rebar, divided them into quadrants and we sowed each quadrant with 800 seeds. So that means we put out about 96,000 seeds total out of the 200, out of the 300,000 we had. One of the quadrants was planted with scarif scarified seeds. We acid scarified these seeds so that they would be non-dormant the first year, so that we knew that if it was a good year at all, we'd see some emergence and we'd begin to be able to sort out what was a good kind of site. The other three quadrants we planted with unscarified seeds in case the first year was a total bust, there'd still be three quarters of the seeds out there ready to try again in another year. So we planted these seeds by broadcast seeding in December. We scored emergence and recruitment spring 2019 and we scored adulthood and seed production, survival to seed production in 2020. And you, you people might know that 2019 and 2020 were both extremely excellent winter precipitation years in the, in the St. George area. They were two great years in a row. So this is just a, a slide of what it looked like putting in these, these plantings. And here's a slide of when we were scoring emergence in the spring, because lo and behold, we did have emergence on our plots. Many of the plants that emerged grew up, they grew a lot, and they, some of them even flowered as seedlings, which is almost unheard of in this species. And that's because it was such a great precip year. So here's what the results look like by site. And don't laugh at the names of these sites. When we get ready to publish this, these will not be the names of the sites, okay? <laughs> but the best one was Susan, okay? <laughs> that can't be a coincidence. Anyway, you can see that we had widely varying success at these different sites. The top graph is for scarified seeds. And remember, we planted 800 seeds per cir circle plot. And at Susan and Yucca, like 300 of those seeds produced recruits. I mean, this is crazy. That's extremely high emergence and establishment success. But there were sites that didn't do so great. And interestingly, the South Hill site, which is, which is a place where there's already Holmgren's milk vet, you didn't do very well at all. Unscarified seeds, you can't really see patterns because there, weren't that, there wasn't that much emergence, but we only expected 10% of those seeds to come up anyway, because that's about how many are released naturally from hard seededness each year. But anyway, first year, great. We thought, okay, we lucked out so far, now what's gonna happen? So then what happened next, in the spring of 2020, another fabulous year, this is how many adult plants there were on one of, on one of those quadrants. This is just the scarified quadrants. 
So this is an, an, an area of like 20 square meters. This is how many plants we had. We had, and you'll notice who the star is here. Susan wins again. This story does get tragic at the end though, I gotta tell you. Anyway, we had very high success for adult plants. Uh, they, they came back from dormancy very well. Overlooked again was a dog, South Hills was not great. I'm sorry, I keep touching my touch screen. The second slide is the, the second panel is the fraction of recruits that came back from dormancy. And at Susan, 60% of them came back from dormancy the second year. The average was about 25%. And that's pretty normal for a good year for this species from Renee's data. And then this last slide is just what fraction of those plants flowered as first year adults. Another way to look at this is return on seed. Of the seeds we planted, what fraction became recruits? So it was anywhere from 12% to all the way up to almost 40% of the seeds recruited the first year. And then the second year, how many for each seed that was planted, let's say it's for each hundred seeds that was planted at Susan, I, we got 25 plants. Can you imagine a seeding? Even in your vegetable garden, you don't think a quarter of the seeds are gonna make plants. And overall, the average was about 8% return on seed. So moral of story, these plants know how to come up from seed in good years. And then there's the seed production. This is Susan. Cody Rominger, my colleague, he flew over this with drones and then he walked over and looked at it and he said, oh my God, it's the sausage factory. <laughs> there, were, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pods on these plots. And in general, we had a lot of pods. So this is the pod number per plot. We went back and evaluated this, right? And Susan still was doing pretty well at about 600 pods per plot. This is again, just on the scarified plots, but the winner was Jenna. And that kind of made me feel good. I didn't want Susan to always be the winner. And then Bitsy did some very laborious quantification of pods collected very systematically in an unbiased way off these plots to quantify seed production. And this is the average number of seeds produced per plot. So you see, Susan kind of took it in the shorts on that one. It didn't produce very many seeds per plot. Jenna produced the best, like 15,000 seeds per plot. That's 800 seeds made 15,000 seeds. So the seeds, seeds produced per seeds sown was just astronomical. So here's the take home. What, what, is the, uh, what does recovery success look like? Not like that. Total number of seeds planted, this is just the scarified quadrants. We planted 24,000 seeds. We estimate we produced 144,000 seeds. That's six seeds for every seeds we planted over all the sites. At Jenna, the best site, we produced 48,000 seeds out of 2,400 seeds. And that is 20 seeds produced for every seed planted. We had 2,000 adult plants established. And we still have money in the bank because 80% of the unscarified seeds are still in the bank. Not only did we put 144,000 new ones in the bank, we still have 72,000 in the bank from the unscarified seeds we planted. So in my opinion, we have established new populations of homeworms milk fetch. Now, not everyone agrees with that. And you know what, it, it, there's not always a happy, what, what looks like a sad ending. Okay, what happens this year when there's no rain? I mean, no rain. We've had one inch since June in St. George. There won't be any Holmgren's milk fetch there. There will be no plants. None of the adults will return. No seedlings will come up and everyone will say, oh no, oh no. But you know, it's normal. It happens. It's happened twice in Renee's data set that there were no plants. They just come back from the seed bank. They know how to do this. But we had another interesting result. Those are the averages of the three circle plots, right? But in fact, within a site, there were wild and crazy differences between the circle plots. Look at Jenna. Jenna's best 
circle produced like 27,000 seeds, but one of the circle plots that Jenna didn't produce any seeds. So what made some circle plots so much more successful than others? It wasn't just the site, it was the actual 30 foot diameter circle that determined whether that was a good site or not. So we wanted to figure out what the difference was between those circles because we wanted to go out and plant more circles, which we did do this December. But first we spent some energy trying to figure out these differences and I'll just present this really fast. We, I'm sorry, I get excited and then I make mistakes. We went out and characterized the habitat on these circle plots and identified the habitat attributes that were significantly correlated with success. And I won't go belabor this too much, but the one I want you to notice is run-on advantage. Now what's run-on advantage? But it, it was positively associated with seedling success, it was positive, positively associated with dormant season survival, was with adult plant density and with pod production. They, they liked to be in a place that was reliably would receive run-on. So we looked at that in a lot more detail. This is Susan, the famous Susan. By the way, the reason Susan tanked, I didn't give you the sad ending, it was such a bonanza with all those hundreds and hundreds of pods essentially piled on top of each other that the kangaroo rats just swarmed it and destroyed a lot of the seed. But you know, that's okay. We don't know that they really destroyed it. They took it somewhere. They took it off the plot. They chewed up the seeds and took the, chewed up the pods and took the seeds away. But we don't really know where those seeds went. But anyway, in our quantification, they were gone. And that's because we were too successful. We were so successful that the rodents thought it was a bonanza. Normally, they don't pay much attention to these seeds. But when they're piled up in a pile, they couldn't resist. Anyway, the, the habitat attributes here are pretty obvious. You've got a big rocky hill crown, a nice steep slope. You've got this little terrace. It's a slightly sloping terrace, finer textured soils, and then the wash. They don't grow in washes. They only grow on these wash terraces. So here's just a little topo map. The stars are the plots we put in. One, two, three. And you can see the steep hill, and, and then, the, then it flattens out. And that's where the plants were so happy. And we, we got another kind of model out of GIS code. He did all this work for us that shows the direction of the flow. So this hillside is flowing straight down onto these plots. So we thought, well, we can use this to find other sites. So here's Susan on that little terrace. And we said, oh, look at this. There's another little terrace, just like that other one. And then we said, well, here's Cody. It did really well. Look, there's a whole bunch more little spots like that down the road from Cody. We could put more, we could put more plots there. So that's what we did. So the moral of the story is it's all about water and it's about run on. They have to be in a place where there's an upland above them that can feed the, the overland flow onto those sites. And that's where the plants are happy. The bromes are a problem. There's the gravel matters, other things matter, but that's basically the main story. Just thank our funders, thank certain people involved in the funding agencies who have been extremely generous. And I wanna shout out Ron Bolander who took a chance on us right at the very beginning and funded us to try this stuff. Jenna has been a, a booster of ours all along the BLM. Everybody in the BLM has just helped us tremendously. Mindy and the ESMF funded this work. And of course, Elaine is, they have a, they have a, TN, they have a, a Holmgren's Preserve too that we've worked on. So we thank you. And this is a success story, even though there won't be any plants out there this year. Thank you. <laughs>